Thank you very much, Paula, and uh, thank you to everyone for this chance to, to take part in the conference, which is so timely and interesting. Um, I'm going to be talking about the securitisation of migration and the crisis for migrants in Europe. But I want to begin with um, a, a mental image or an allegory. I wonder, I'm sure all of you at some point in your lives have read a piece of creative writing that evokes such powerful images that it stays with you in your head ever after and keeps coming back even unbidden at times. For me, one such piece of writing is Nadine Gordner's dystopian children's story, Once Upon a Time. Nadine Gordner was a South African writer and uh, she lived through the apartheid years. Um, and this story has left an image in my mind that uh, continues to haunt. Gordner's tale is a very dark fable written for the South Africa she lived in. It starts as initially a very happy story of a beautiful, small, white family, a father, a mother, and a little son with their pets, their maid, their gardener. But it turns increasingly bleak as the parents allow a sense of insecurity to creep into their lives. Their worrisome knowledge that the poor and dispossessed live nearby but out of sight becomes intensified into fear stoked by rumours and local burglaries. And this leads them to start securing their home. First, they put in alarms, and then they bar the windows. But finally, they choose razor wire. Then, their playful and imaginative little boy, inspired by reading Sleeping Beauty, decides to tackle the fence as if cutting down the briars of a sleeping palace. The story ends with horror as his body is caught and destroyed by the ensnaring razor teeth. This story is a powerful allegory of what fear of outsiders and the building of security fences against them do, not only to those they are intended to keep out, consigning them to suffer the exclusionary injustices of apartheid in this particular case, but also what it does to those who build them. Attempts at <coughs> fear-fueled fear separation rebound on those behind the walls, creating what turns out to be a very false security and suffocating the joy and creativity <coughs> in life which the little boy represents in the story. So I read that in 1991, um, so we're 25 years on, but it's a frightening image, um, it's that frightening image of the child torn in the security fence, which somehow got embedded into my subconscious and to which my mind always seems to wander back unbidden when I encounter any of our attempts to deal with others, those we fear, by building walls or fences. It could be Berlin or Palestine and Israel, it could be the Mexican-US border, it could even be Belfast and its peace lines. But in relation to the current crisis for migrants, it's the fences at Kuwaita and Melilla, in Calais, but most obviously at the Hungarian border, which come to my mind. Indeed, Nadim Gordner could be describing the hundreds of kilometers of razor wire rolled out across Hungary's borders with its neighbors when she described the fence, and this is her words. It was the ugliest, but the most honest security device in its suggestion of pure concentration camp style. No frills, all evident efficiency. Place the length of walls, it consisted of a continuous coil of stiff and shining metal serrated with jagged blades. So there was no way of climbing over it and no way through its tunnel without getting entangled in its fangs. The little boy's parents took heed of the advice on the small board fixed to the wall. <clears throat> Consult dragon's teeth, the people for total security. The Hungarian fence, uh, which is made of steel and razor wire, um, could be caught in that description. Whenever Viktor Orban or members of his government speak of it, they usually focus on the two functions they claim that this fence fulfills. It's both a means to secure Hungary and Europe from the criminality associated with migration, and it's a means to keep Hungarian culture free of alien influences. I'm very aware I have a Hungarian colleague sitting right next to me here, so <laughs> um, I hope I'm not saying anything completely out of turn and you will have much more <coughs> expertise to share uh, in, on you this sing the topic. Same song. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> so. 
Over the last decade, much of my own research has been focused on the politics surrounding the issue of human trafficking. It's therefore been a very deep source of interest to me that in justifying this razor wire fence, Prime Minister Orban frequently and specifically invokes its utility as an anti-human trafficking device. For example, he refers to the fence as a means to stop and catch human traffickers, promising that Hungary will meet out, this is him, punishment for human trafficking that will be so severe that it will be really deserved by those who do business with the life and fate of others. By stopping migrants reaching Europe, the government claims to be doing a good service, preventing traffickers taking people to Germany. Orban's approach may be uniquely vociferous, but he's not alone within Europe in using the issue of human trafficking as a means to legitimate a militarised, securitised response to migration. Over last summer, the EU's external affairs representatives explored the idea that the EU should seek consent from the UN to undertake intelligence gathering and then military manoeuvres intended to destroy the boats of traffickers and smugglers near the Libyan coast. Although, as far as I know, this has yet to come to pass, this is a further example of the desire to tackle human trafficking being used by governments as a means to endorse state security style responses to the movement of people. Justifying responses intended to stop migrants physically from travelling to or entering Europe in the name of preventing human trafficking might seem rather bizarre to many civil society organisations and the individuals who have made ending human trafficking and protecting victims a key concern, indeed something of a cause celebre over the last two decades. Human trafficking was defined in an international treaty, the United Nations Palermo Protocol of the year 2000, as the coercive or deceitful movement of people, often but not necessarily across borders, for exploitative ends including sexual or labour exploitation or the removal of their organs. A determination to prevent the abuse of people, particularly migrants, seems therefore to be at the heart of the concern with human trafficking. However, I think it's very important to recognise that the Palermo Protocol sits inside the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organised Crime. There are two other protocols in the Convention, one on the trade in illegal firearms and the other on the smuggling of humans. And this means, as many critics have pointed out, that the Convention and its protocols are primarily instruments for states to pursue their interests in relation to security, law and order. The anti-trafficking protocol is not a human rights instrument and the protections it offers for trafficking victims are very weak. Rather, the protocol dwells on tightening up border controls as a means of countering human trafficking. It's not a coincidence that concerns about human trafficking and smuggling were resurrected in the 1990s and the aftermath of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War destabilised our prevailing international knowledge about what constitutes security threats and shook many international borders. Transnational organised crime is now identified by governments as one of several new security threats emerging from that disruptive period. By extension, the association of human trafficking with transnational crime enables states to ensure that those deemed to be smugglers or traffickers are labelled in the public mind as organised criminal threats to European states and thus security responses can be legitimised. In Kamala Kempadu's words, she's a well-known writer on human trafficking, there is collateral damage for migrants as a consequence of anti-trafficking policies which shore up policing and fortification of borders. But the framing of human trafficking as a security threat to states is just one elaboration of what we can call the wider securitisation of migration prevailing in the post-Cold War world. Prior to the 1990s, migration was an issue of either economics or humanitarian question, but this changed with the defrosting Cold War. This week, to prepare this talk, I reread one of the first articles to name the phenomenon, Jeff Huseman's 2001 article, The European Union and the Securitization of Migration. And it was a very salutary experience, as the world he describes of 15 years ago is rather unchanged. Huseman's argued that the completion of the internal European market and the formation of the Schengen Agreement were both integral to each other. The abolition of internal borders led to the necessity of external border control. And so the socio-economic project of the single European market and internal mobility spilled out into a security project. Solidifying internal cohesion came at the cost of what he calls reifying dangers from outside 
and presenting migration as, in his words, a danger to public order, cultural identity, and labor market stability, with Schengen explicitly connecting immigration, again in his words, to terrorism, transnational crime, and border control. Oh, you're going to quote him as well. <laughs> we, we, we obviously should have talked beforehand, sorry. Um, sometimes it seems we are caught in a time warp as the politicians of 2015 continue to connect migration to all these very phenomena. Viktor Orban's statements capture all these concerns from crime and terror threats he sees posed by migration to the worry that Hungary's 1,000 years of Christian culture is imperiled by this new wave of migration. In the academic discipline of international relations that I belong to, the tendency to discuss new security threats, often including migration, has been very prevalent in the post-Cold War world. A recent conference at the Department of Foreign Affairs, which several of us in the room were at, reviewed several such new threats, including pandemics, terrorism, and <coughs> cyber attacks. Often in such dis discussions, however, I think there is a failure to ask who is the referent of security. In other words, we fail to ask who is insecure. Discourses about human security evolved in the academic world, but also in fora such as the UN trying to address this core question have turned to, to recognizing the importance of talking about human security. In the current situation of mass migration, I would suggest that it is vital to recognize that insecurity is primarily experienced by those who are on the move. And I think in this, I'm just repeating some of the things that Rachel already said, and Salam, and others this morning, and uh, <laughs> you're going to say this afternoon. Uh, so I must admit that I am increasingly irritated by even the terminology used to describe what's happening, Europe's migration crisis, when in fact the crisis is for those people who are on the move. It is migrants, and this is just what Rachel said, so I'm completely reiterating her, it is migrants who are experiencing fundamental human insecurity as they are forced into movement by war, terror, and poverty, yet are increasingly meeting European responses that treat them only as a security threat. My colleague in the Trinity School of Nursing, uh, Dr. Fintan Sheeran, shared with me a piece he wrote um, about a trip he made as a medical, as a nurse, to the jungle in Calais. He was appalled that the only response the French government offered to the camp is a policing one. Not even basic human needs of sanitation and shelter are being provided. As well as the immediate stresses caused by this situation, as Hussmans points out in his article, the treatment of migration as a security threat makes it much more difficult to integrate migrants into new contexts in the long run. I realise, of course, that to argue against the securitisation of migration is a harder point to make this week than it would have been just a few days ago after the terror attacks in Paris. And indeed, the identification of one of the attackers as someone who might have travelled the migration route as a false refugee, to use the headlines of one newspaper, refuels the readiness to see migrants as a security threat. And several governments, as has already been mentioned, are backing away from taking Syrian refugees as a consequence. Of course, I believe this to be a faulty analysis and a mistaken policy. Firstly, as we've been reminded this morning, and as one letter writer to the Irish Times early this week noted, many Syrian refugees are running from the very same terror which devastated Paris. And in my colleague Fintan's uh, experience in the jungle in Calais, he met with several people who had experienced torture at the hands of ISIS who were now in Calais. And secondly, assuming people to be a threat and subjecting them to exclusion on that basis is only a source for further disaffection and radicalization. Pragmatically, too, the flow of people is not going to cease as long as the roots of displacement and the paltry conditions that many experience in the region's refugee camps persist. And therefore, we need to think both about better ways to deal with the movement of people into Europe and also the long-term causes and consequences of this. But I also think that the way we respond to migrants, um, it's, but I also think it matters that we respond in a way that does not uh, securitize migrants, not just because of its impact on the migrants, but because of the allegory I started with. As Bridget Anderson, another well-known writer on migration issues, has written in her book, which she has entitled Us and Them, how we respond to and treat migrants says as much about us as it does about them. How open can we be to humans in distress? 
How open are we to diversity in our national communities? And my, again, my colleague Finton, uh, on the basis of his experience in Cali, asked the question, who is really dehumanized by what goes on in Cali? Is it the migrants or is it the Europeans who refuse to respond? So therefore, I think in closing, it's worth asking what would be the more ethical and practical European response to the reality of people who are caught in this um, securitized migration situation? What can we do rather than securitizing migrants and criminalizing the traffickers and smugglers and building the barriers and the fences around Fortress Europe ever higher, which in the long run compound the problems? In one recent article in the Irish Times, Fintan O'Toole made three suggestions concerning the immediate Mediterranean crisis, and he was writing in the summer, but the, the issue would still be relevant now. He says, we need a coordinated international strategy to deal with the needs of many people on the move. Importantly, he says, European governments should talk calmly and humanely to their people, rather than hype up anti-immigrant rhetoric. And then, of course, we need to address the long-term structural causes of migration, which lie in global poverty, climate change, and the many wars, which Rachel explained to us in her talk. I think these are all very important points to bear in mind if we want to avoid sowing the dragon's teeth of the opening allegory. That it's important that we recognize that in making securitized responses to migration, we harm both them and us. Thank you. Thank you very much.